Luke chapter 24, and in verse 13. The Bible reads, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another, as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass therein these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O ye fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward even, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they arose up that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, the Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. And as they thus spoke, as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were afraid and affrighted, and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me to have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were yet, and while they yet believed not for joy, and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a, pl a piece of a broiled fish and an honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they made understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on, from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Amen. As we read through even these scriptures, we start to get a picture of 
post-resurrection Christianity. We start to see, first of all, descriptions, and I may not get to this, so I just wanted to touch on it, of what the resurrected body would entail. We often uh, romanticize, we often think about, we often contemplate and meditate upon what is it really going to be like when we finally breathe our last breath, are carried away in the spirit into heaven, dwell there until the timing of the rapture, of which time we will be united with our resurrected body and be in that glorified state. We wonder about these things. And a few portions of scripture just kind of bring it to light. Because the Bible teaches that we shall be as Christ. The Bible says that he hath not flesh and bones, the spirit speaking, but Christ had both. He had flesh and bones. He was able to be touched and handled, and yet the Bible records, though his flesh and his bones were able to be touched and handled by the disciples, he was able to appear in a moment in the midst of the disciples, suggesting that there is some sort of disconnect between the body and the temporal world, whereby he could even pass through walls. The Bible describes Jesus in his resurrected state here, eating of a broiled fish and a honeycomb, taking it, eating it before them. And again, prophesying, preaching that these things should all come to pass. And this is the message that you must proclaim yourselves, that thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer, to rise again the third day, to the purpose that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. His commission foretold that their first priority was to be their Jerusalem. It was to begin there and be carried forth into the uttermost parts of the earth. And again, Christ shows that he is not confined by this world, not confined by, by matter in, in the same regard as we are when he rises up and goes and dwells at the right hand of God the Father. And that's how this story, as told from the perspective of St. Luke, is told and that's how it goes forth now what I really want to focus in on is these two men as they travel to a man is Cleopas being one of them and as he and his comrade went forth from the scene of the apostles and the disciples gathered together as Mary and Joanna came and preached and told that story. It almost seems like they parted. There were some brethren, Peter being one, that went down unto the sepulcher. He went to confirm what the ladies that had said in that it was empty and that there was nothing there. And in doing so, he at some point saw Jesus and confirmed not only the empty tomb but the resurrected Christ as our, as our scriptures tell us here. And eventually these same disciples come to realize. But for now, they seem to have went away discouraged. Maybe it was because they had heard the message from the ladies and they just didn't buy it. They decided not to go down. They were just so disgruntled and discouraged. They separated from the fellowship and began to leave Jerusalem. Began to leave that fellowship, that gathering together of the brethren in Jerusalem. And we notice that as they left... They went in pairs. We often hear that phrase, that misery loves company. And this is exactly what happened. Maybe the one wasn't as miserable as the other. But these two found one another and eventually sought the same level, left the city. And when they're on their way to Emmaus was when they had this chance encounter with Christ. And though I believe it was foretold, it was meant to fulfill a purpose of God, he never wants people to be outside his will. He never wants people to be away from the fellowship of the believers. He never wanted people to do that to begin with. Because later he's going to tell the same group that I send thee the promise of my Father, tarry ye here in Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. So Christ, as he has always wanted to do, he, will, he gathered together his disciples, even those lost sheep that had wandered away. Even that singular man that I, I think perhaps drug another miserable man off with him on the way to Emmaus. He made sure to gather them all back together and tell them to wait now for the promise. Stay here in Jerusalem until you be endued with power on high, on which time you are going to preach in Jerusalem. You are going to preach in Samaria. You're going to preach in the uttermost part of the world. Then will be the time when you have the power of the Holy Ghost to go forth with my message. So here the discouraged walk away. They leave the company. They leave the fellowship. They leave the gathering. And you find that there in verse, verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day into a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about 
three score furlongs. And so they traveled this long road from Jerusalem into Emmaus, whereby they were going to leave their problems behind. They were going to leave their, min their miserableness behind. And as they go, verse 14 records that, and they talk together of all these things which had happened. Now you've got to ask yourself, as these men who are, are very miserable, they're very sad, they're very discouraged, are walking away, do you think they're talking about all the great times they had with their Savior? The great times where He washed their feet, where He ministered unto them, where He taught them great scriptural truths and, and prayed for them, prayed with them, suffered with them, won great victories with them, saw people saved with them. No, I think as these were walking away, perhaps their focus was on the negative. Perhaps they talked about things that were of loss, about hurts, about regrets, about, about sufferings, about trials, about all of the negatives that had happened to them as they talked together of those things which had happened and as they walked one with another away from the will of God in this area, away from the gathering of themselves together. Verse 15 says, And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, and I'll leave that there, perhaps this is the problem, is that they are reasoning one with another. We got two men that are miserable and they're walking this road to Emmaus and they're reasoning one with another. Perhaps it was very carnal, their reasonings. Perhaps they talked about how the government is corrupt. Perhaps they talked about how the structure of the system, that world system, is corrupt. And they had all these vain conversations and reasoning from man's perspective about why they crucified their Savior, whom they expected should have been the carnal, worldly deliverer of of them they walk and they talk of loss of hurt of regrets reasoning rather than looking to the scriptures is what I expect was happening men's reasoning often creeps in and stifles the spiritual truths of any situation we want to reason we want to rationalize we want to conceptualize something that is going on in our lives in such a way that we can bring it down to men's perspective and understand it from a carnal viewpoint. The reality is, is most of the Christian life has events and circumstances and timings and things that are outside of the carnal realm. We need to understand that there is a bigger spiritual battle being fought and just as Elias' servant was had his eyes open to see the great horde of evil coming upon him, but rather had the great horde of God's angels upon him, he needed to recognize, and we need to recognize, that there is a bigger spiritual battle to everything in our lives. And don't let our reasoning, don't let man's opinion and man's understanding of certain situations and certain things stifle the deeper spiritual truths that are going on in our lives. Verse 15 in the second part says, As they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Glory to God. Aren't you glad even when we're carnally minded, Jesus intercedes. Jesus imposes himself in our lives. He finds himself on the same road that we are walking. He finds his footprints marking the same path that you are trotting in order that he would be with you and go with you. Jesus himself drawing near, even when we're pushing away and going outside of her, our, his will. Even when we are leaving behind where he wants us to be. And that future command and that future instruction that he is going to give us. We're leaving that behind and walking in the wrong direction. And even still, Jesus comes to find his sheep and bring them back into the fold. Glory to God that Jesus himself drew near and went with these two men. And he does the same for us. And I am so thankful that Jesus is already prepared to step in and to get me back on track when I start to fade, when I start to waver, when I start to doubt, when I start to get caught up in the focus of negative loss, hurts, regrets, and all the things that reasoning of men and reasoning in my own heart will bring into my life. Christ steps in and gets my focus back on what is important. Verse 16 says, and this is the problem with all of us, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And how often in tough times do our eyes get holding? Do we see 
not the fact that Christ is there. And most of us at this point, when something as hard and difficult as seeing our Savior, seeing our leader, seeing our love leave us, forsake us in our mind, in our understanding, when we were to, if we were to see Christ die that death, we would have that same mentality when we saw him again. We would say, how can God be in such a situation? And how often does the earth or the world decry exactly that? Well, I've been through this loss. My family member died. How can God be in that situation? I'm, I'm, I'm broken. I'm in debt and I'm suffering. How can God be in that situation? I'm sick. My family member's sick. There's so much suffering and sadness and mourning and loss and negative in this world. How? Can Christ, how can God be in this situation? And in tough times, just as these two disciples were, they had their eyes holding that they could not know him. They should not know him. Recognize that Christ was there, walking the same path they were trotting with them. And too often we do the same thing. We don't see Christ in the tough times. Verse 17 says, And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these? that ye have one to another, as ye walk and are sad. And glory to God, he's always good at asking the right questions. <laughs> he's always good at pointing us by means of the perfect question at just the right time. And that's quite often the still small voice that I have. It'll be just a scripture in the form of a question. Shouldest thou Ought thou, you know, God's kind of speaking into my heart. And just those simple questions that bring this prompting and this prick to my heart where I understand, ooh, I'm in the wrong here. And here Christ says unto them, what are you talking about? Why are you walking and talking with sadness? Why is your journeying done with such mourning and such loss and such downtroddenness? Why are you walking and talking with with sadness. He asked this question to the purpose that he would promote reflection within those that he was pointing it to. And though this world is a mess, I ask you the same question. Though your life perhaps is, is a trial and a, and a turmoil of events, I ask you the same question. As you walk through this life, reflect on this. What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? So as we're walking and treading this life, as we're walking that path that God has before us, what manner of communications do you have? Why are you sad? Why are you downtrodden? Why are you defeated? There is no good reason. I repeat, there is no good reason for a believer on the Lord Jesus Christ to walk and to talk with such woe and such sadness. There is no good answer to this question that Jesus Christ posed. This is one of those things where Jesus asks the question and you should just be like, yep, you're right, I'm sorry. And get it right. He's emphasizing the fact that all of what's going on in their life, all of this sadness was to the end that he would rise from the dead and set them spiritually free. And yet they're missing it. Their eyes are holden. And though they have heard all that's been told of the women, and perhaps of the men, maybe even they interacted with them before they went, that there had been sightings, there had been visual recollections of Jesus Christ in his risen state, having overcome death and hell. And there were witnesses. They chose to cover their eyes to it and continue to lie to themselves in order that they could justify being in such a sad and mournful state. There is no good reason for a believer to walk and to talk in such a way, to be trapped in this sadness. Verse 18, And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast thou not known the things which are come to pass these days? Now try as we may, as Cleopas does here, he's trying to justify the reason why he's sad. 
Jesus comes to him and says, why are you walking and talking with such sadness? There's no good response for that. But his response is, of course there is. Are you a stranger? Are you new? Have you not heard of all which has come to pass? He responds to Christ in such a way to suggest with that open and blank state, do you not know how bad things are? Do you not know how miserable things are? Do you not know how hard and challenging and my life is and how I've been suffering such things and how it's so hard from day to day to day? Are you a stranger? Are you new? Don't you know what's going on? In Christ here, some would expect that he would be like, yeah, you're right. Absolutely. It's so bad and you have every right to be sad. You have every right to feel down. No, Christ asks this. They say, haven't you seen how awful our state is? Haven't you seen all the terrible things that have gone on? Verse 19, and he said unto them, what things? They're going to begin saying, as we do often, when we justify ourselves for walking sadly, for walking mournfully, for walking downtrodden, even as saved, blood-bought, resurrected children of the King, when we should be rejoicing, we're going to give God a big list of all the things, all the reasons, all the justifications as to why we are so sad and miserable in the life that we're living. We're going to say we have pains, we have aches, my finances are a mess. My relationships are falling apart. I'm discouraged. I'm often rejected of those even that I love. There's so many confusions in my life. I just don't understand. Have you not seen my past, Lord? And all these things that contribute to my sadness, to my depression, to my fallen state where I'm just defeated and sad and woeful. Jesus says, what things? What reasons have you to be so sad? Why are you walking and talking, living your life in such a sad state? What things contribute to such a thing? And they said, in verse 19b, and they're going to do the same thing that we have done and often do. They said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And, concer and certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it even so as the women have said, but they saw him not. They give that big long list, well of course we're sad because all this has come to be. And their eyes were so holden that they didn't know Christ, but their eyes were so holden that they didn't know that the testimonies of, their testimony as to why things were so sad, was actually an affirmation of the great glory that they should have been embracing as a wonderful truth that would bring them joy. They had just said that the women saw an empty tomb and saw angels announcing that the Savior was risen. They had just said that there were some who had seen the risen Savior, and yet they're still going to use that reasoning to justify why they are sad. How many times do we have things going really good in our lives, and as a depressed person, we tend to make the worst out of them? People often will have something go really great in their life, and because they're so bent and so fixed on being depressed and being sad, and they're used to that state, and yes, that's a state of your old life. Depression is a state of your own life. But too often we get trapped in those cycles whereby when even something great happens, you're going to find some way of making it something wrong, making it something bad and poor. You overcome something, and yet it becomes this stepping stone to complain about another thing. You have mended a relationship, and let you're going to beat yourself up and say, well, I'm just going to mess that up again. You have a pain in your back. It starts to feel better, but you're like, yeah, but you know, my, my knee has been compensating for my back pain. And we start to try to take things that are good. We start to try to take victories in our lives. We try to take things that God is doing in our life, even the announcement of the resurrected Savior. And when Jesus says, what things are making you miserable? We say, well, all these things. And somebody else would look at those as a great blessing. We should be looking at those same things as a great blessing in your life. And yet we're trapped in this pit of despair, in this woeful, mourning, loss, sad state. 
We notice, even though they have this big list of things to justify why they're sad, and even though we ourselves in this room have these reasons to justify why we are sad, Jesus doesn't jump on board with our pity party. He doesn't jump on board with their pity party He's, and say, you know, you're right, and coddle them and help them in their self-absorbed pity party. Say, it's okay that everything's going wrong for you. No, Christ hears them out as he asks, what things are making you so sad? And his response is, Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Isn't this exactly what I promised? Isn't this exactly what the scriptures said would happen? Why are you so slow to believe the prophets? And even after that, why are you so slow to believe your brethren who have testified of these things? He doesn't meet them where they're at and just coddle them in their woeful mourning state. Christ says, get it together, man. Ye fools and slow of heart to believe what the prophets have said. Christ should have done this. He should have suffered this way. He should have entered into glory just as the Bible promised. And yet you've missed it. He rebuked them. And even though they didn't like what they saw, and even though they misunderstood and misinterpreted what they had said, because remember, look in verse 21. We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And didn't he do that? Just because he didn't come as the conquering king and slay, slay the Caesar and take over Rome, the area that they were in, and just because he didn't take this big political uh, upheaval and, and rule from the earth as a king like that, because that's what their minds conceived of should be happening. Just because they didn't like how or realize how because they had holding eyes doesn't mean that Christ didn't do exactly what he had planned. And in the same way in our lives, just because we don't like how God moves into our life, how God walks with us and talks with us and leads us about and brings circumstances our way, just because we don't get the fact that He is with us and He led us into such a situation, and because He did exactly what He promised according to the Scriptures, just because we don't like it doesn't mean that it wasn't God's doing, it wasn't God's will. And how often do we have these same holden eyes as these two? And when Jesus asks us why we are sad, we begin at our miseries and all the problems and expound in all the stories the things concerning ourself. We begin at miseries and all the problems and expound in all the stories the things concerning ourself. And this is rightfully rebuked. Christ doesn't spare. He says, you fools. What a thing to say, right? How, how many times do you want to hear from your Lord? You fool! Like, but, but sometimes we get so defeated, we get so beat up. We're acting like lost people because we're miserable. We should be rejoicing and jumping for joy in certain situations and certain circumstances that roll our way. We should be happy that we have a home in heaven. And yet we act like fools. We act like unbelievers. We act like the lost world. And we deserve Christ to step in and say, Ye fool! And slow to understand, ye fool, and with that slow heart, believe what the prophets have said. Like I said, we begin at the miseries and all the problems and expounded all the stories of things concerning us. These are the things that are affecting him. But Christ takes that and he does what's right. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Our life shouldn't be an endless trail of the woes that we have and stories about how we're suffering and stories about how things are hard and justification to explain why my life is so miserable. Our life and our joy begins just like verse 27. Our joy, our victory, our triumph, our success in the Christian life beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them in all the scriptures concerning himself. Amen. That needs to be the focus of even our lives. Our life which is hid in Christ. Our life which is in him. It needs to be the focus of our entire being. Now, these specific things that happen in our life 
we're even told about in the scriptures. We think that perhaps the scriptures are something that we just kind of learn from and dig truths out, and they are that, but it's also a living word that very really describes the lives that we live and talks about our own self at a very personal level. Not me talking about me, but the scripture revealing me and to my own self. Does not the Bible reveal specifically to us that we would be persecuted? And does not the Bible reveal specifically to us as believers that we would be hated of all nations for his name's sake? Does the Bible not describe that God made the poor of this world rich in spirit? Does it not say that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain unto now? Does it not say that this life is vanity, that dust we are and dust we shall return? So then why do we get so confused when we go through pains and aches? Why do we get so confused when our finances are a mess and we're poor? When our relationships are falling apart just as God promised? When we're discouraged, when we're rejected, when we're confused, when our, our past is a mess because we used to be lost but now we're trying to reform and we're trying to live right? Why do we let all of these things bog us down and ruin our testimony, ruin our walk, so that the things that we are saying and communicating and the walk that we take each and every day is nothing but sadness and woe? Why do we let this happen? God promised many of these things. And you know, we should be able to rejoice in the fact that God revealed these things unto us before they came unto us. He gave us the warning. He let us know, I have told you these things before, that when they shall appear, you shall not faint. He's told us these things before, that when they shall come to pass, we will not fear. We will not doubt. We will not be discouraged, but rather we should be persecuted and say, glory to God. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. When God says that he made the poor in this world rich in spirit, we should rejoice and say, Glory to God that my wealth is great in heaven. Glory to God that I have a mansion that he hath built himself for me. We should rejoice in those Bible truths that he expounds unto us in all the scriptures throughout Moses and throughout all the prophets, the things concerning Christ, and even things that reflect unto us and to our lives, those specific truths from the scriptures and how they speak unto us. But how about the specifics to him? How about in verse 27 when he starts to begin to explain to them himself, the testimony that they had missed, the truth that they had missed, the revelation of himself that he had missed, the finished work of Christ that he promised. Ought Christ not to have suffered these things? They didn't get it. Their eyes were holding that they should not behold them. And so Christ came to them. He found those lost sheep that were discouraged, that were weak, that were feeling lost, that were feeling defeated, that had a different idea of what God should be working in their lives. And he, in a very real way, stepped into their lives and rebuked them and corrected them and chastened them and said, you, you fools, it's slow of heart. But then softly and delicately and gently, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Let me take you on a walk. Let me take you down this path. Let me show you how Genesis 1 leads into Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And all of these things are simply a revelation of what you're experiencing today. And he showed them to bring it to perspective, to bring it to pass, that they would understand in all the scriptures that Christ must suffer these things and return up to glory. He did that out of a gracious heart. He did that out of a loving heart. And even when God rebukes you and shows you a scripture, just as he did to these gentlemen, we need not allow that to be another reason why we just get even more defeated. God rebuked me. No, this is the stepping stone to repentance, which is the road to victory and back into the will of God and back into his love and back into the path that he has before us and not our own path, not our own reasoning, which is what these two are after. Verse 28, I love this. And they drew nigh unto the village. So the place where they went, and it says here, whither they went, the path had ended for them. This is where they desired to go. This is where their reasoning had led them. This is where their, their own way had taken them. And as they did, it says this. And he made, this is Jesus, he made as though he would have gone further. So now Christ has drawn them in. He's imposed himself in their situation. He's walking with them. He's beginning at Moses and the prophets, expounding unto them that these things must need 
come to pass. He's met them where he's at, but he's not going to forcefully constrain them here to join in and yoke up with him and be in his will. Now he made like he was going to keep going. He was going to carry on and leave them in their own way. But I love this. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward even, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And this is how God's going to work in our lives too. He's going to speak to us in the scriptures. He's going to reveal himself. He's going to reveal truths about us in the scriptures. He'll rebuke us. He'll rebuke us sharply. And then he will expound unto us in the scriptures all the things concerning himself. All the things of this life. All the victory that we can have in Christ. How we can leave behind that rebuke. But he's only going to take us so far to where we now have to make the choice whether we yield unto his spirit and whether we invite him in to speak more to us. So when you are rebuked of God, don't forsake it, don't reject it, don't push it away, but rather constrain him to abide more with you. Because this is just the beginning of the path. God's going to rebuke you. God's going to chasten you, give a scripture that clearly indicates that you're wrong. And now it's your decision time. You're in your own walk. You're in your own path. You're in your own mindset. You've got things made up. You've got things figured out. You're reasoning with yourselves. And you've got friends along with you that are on board with your miserable ways. And Christ imposed himself, rebukes you, gives you scripture. And now it's your responsibility to constrain him to stay with you, continuing in the ministry that he has. Now, when he would have passed by, they convinced him to stay. And we ought to do the same. When the word meets us, we ought to constrain the word to stay with us. When the Bible starts speaking to you in your morning reading plan, and it's, it, it's, it's just heating up, it's starting to get really good, you're really having the Bible open itself up to you, and you're really understanding things, Time to constrain God to stay with you a little bit longer. Time to reach forth and grab hold of the next chapter, or maybe the next chapter. Just see what God has for you for that day, for that time. Constrain Him to abide with you. Because it could be that you're almost there. You're almost back to that path. Because at this point, their eyes were still holding that they should not know Him. Verse 30, it says, And it came to pass, as He sat at meat with them and took bread and blessed it and break and gave it to them their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight what a neat thing they he, he they would have missed that right they would have missed the understanding they would have missed the spiritual truth of it all they would have missed the revelation of Christ they would have missed knowing him if they would have just finished off their journey in that path and let Christ walk away. But instead, they invite him in. They bring him in. They draw him in. Even as he drew them, even as he met them, he, he, he doesn't the Bible say, draw nigh unto me and I will draw nigh unto you, right? There's kind of that meeting in the middle where we, we have to agree one with another. Can two walk together except they be agreed, the Bible says. And so in that moment, they bring him in. They tarried together, came to pass. He grabs the meat. He grabs the bread. He breaks it. And I, I wonder if in that exact moment where that breaking of bread happened, if it didn't click in their minds, if they didn't finally, oh, wow, it's the Lord, and then he's gone. What in, the, what in the world? What just happened? And these guys are like, that's that's crazy. Their eyes were open, and they knew him, and he immediately vanished out of their sight, and they're sitting there dumbfounded, like, what are we doing here? Where? How did we get here? What happened? Where? And, and suddenly everything seems clear to them. While their eyes were holding, while they were walking a path with eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear, and the scriptures are being expounded and they're being rebuked of the Lord, they say, Lord, stay a little bit longer. And he breaks that bread. Their eyes are opened and then he's gone. On his way, wherever the Lord needed to go. And they said one to another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us, the scriptures. Looking back now, they're like, it's so clear that it was the Lord. It, it makes perfect sense the whole time that he's been expounding. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, he's, he's opening the Bible unto us. He took us to Malachi. He took us to Isaiah, Jeremiah. He gave us all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. He preached unto us Christ, and we get it, and we got it. And it's great, and it was wonderful. Didn't our hearts burn? Didn't we have like an intense feeling that it was just true, it was just right, it was burning into our very soul, just like Jeremiah preached where he could not contain for the burning within his heart. Didn't our eye, our heart burn in that same way as Christ taught us of the scriptures? See, they had open eyes, and they had spiritually opened eyes. 
And when their eyes were holding and let loose, suddenly all of the carnal issues, all of the problems that they had were swept away. Verse 31 says, and their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. Two things are happening. Their eyes are open, but then they lose the ability to use their eyes. It's amazing because the spiritual truth had come to them. The spiritual understanding had come to them. And now there was no need for the carnal interpretation. There was no need for the humanistic reasoning. There was no need for the flesh and bone Christ to be with them because they had the spiritual understanding of the greater purpose contained within the Bible. All things revealed it to themselves. So as their eyes were open, they lost sight of the Lord. As their eyes were open spiritually, they lost sight of the carnal presence of him, if I can say it that way. They had a spiritual understanding. They turned them to the spiritual understanding and then had no need for the physical Christ. And when he disappeared, it was like, how did we not know it was the Lord all along? How did we not realize from the burning within our hearts as the scriptures were expounded unto us? And as we understood, how did we not see it? What did they do? They rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared unto Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. It must have been amazing because I bet you these guys didn't, didn't just sneak off quietly when they were told the news from the women and when some of the men came and reported it. They might have just outright rejected it with holding eyes, with blind eyes to the truths of the scripture, to the truths of what had happened. And they probably stormed off and made a big scene. What a miracle, what a wonderful thing when those that would not hear the testimony of the Savior came running back in testifying of the Savior. Everyone witnessing, everyone rejoicing, everyone seeing the great change that Christ had done into them. And he had done it by simply opening the scriptures, beginning at Moses and the prophets, and expounding them unto them. And we can have that same ministry within our hearts where we have total transformation each and every day if we open the scriptures and beginning at Moses and all the prophets allow God to expound unto us all the things concerning himself and just when we think we've heard all we need to hear that day, constrain him to give you more. Constrain him to give you more. Just constrain him to give you more until your eyes are opened and you no longer need to see the carnal. You no longer see your hardships. You no longer see your aches and pains and your sufferings and the rejections and the confusions. You no longer see the things of this world because you have seen the Savior. What a joy that is. And as soon as that is received, as soon as the end of that thing, as soon as we see Christ, there's only one thing to do. Share it. Open the scriptures, carry them forth as they did, rising up the same day, charging into Jerusalem, proclaiming, The Lord is risen indeed! And he hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. And so how is he known to us? Yes, to them, they had revelation. They finally got it. It clicked in the breaking of bread. It took them back to the Last Supper, and they understood how Christ would pray and how he would break bread and give unto his disciples and that's how he revealed himself in this to us when we go back is, is Christ known to us in the reading of the Passover is Christ known unto us within the offerings and the sacrifices that are given is he known to us in the ministry of the Garden of Eden as Adam and Eve walked with God is he known of us as he is placed upon as the sacrificed lamb, as a covering for their sins. Is he known of us in all of the types as we read? The breaking of bread was what gave them the revelation. The breaking of bread was what gave them understanding as they constrained him. And that one last truth needed to enter into them before they finally got it. As we behold the scriptures, as we behold that to him give all the prophets witness, as we read Genesis and Exodus and Jeremiah and Leviticus and, and uh, Isaiah, Isaiah and Joel Amos, as we read these Bible stories, as we read these scriptures, do we have that same experience? Do we hear him? Do we know him? And then do we tell of him? Because that is the ministry of God to us. He wants to begin in all of his scriptures and in all of his prophets and in all of the writings of Moses and use these to expound of himself, that we would experience Christ, that we would know 
Christ, that we would hear him, know him, and eventually, once our eyes are opened, once we see the risen Savior, we would take these same truths and we would proclaim them unto others. That's the end of all this, because what did we already talk about? These, these men went out and they walked and they talked in a woeful and doleful and miserable way. They were nothing for the cause of Christ. Nobody is going to be get excited about believing on the Savior that just makes you more miserable than you already are. And too often that's how Christians are. We're just bogged down by the way of this world. And we're not living as if living unto the kingdom. We're living as if we're building our kingdom down upon earth. And if I'm building a kingdom down upon earth, well, no wonder I'm so miserable. No wonder I'm so sad. If Christ be not risen, you got every reason to be sad. you got every reason to be miserable. But because he is miserable, we can look past the present. We can look past our experiences now. We can look past our hardships and our trials and our circumstances, our tribulations, and we can look unto Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, and for the joy set before him where he endured the cross, the joy set before us can allow us to endure any cross as well. And then we can go in that same joy and in that same testimony and that same rejoicing, uplifting spirit and not be bogged down by misery, but be rejoicing in the Savior that has set us free from all these things. And that's the Christian life that allows you to be free even when you're in prison. Allows you to sing hymns even on a stake being burned. Allow you to be thrown to the lions and be preaching the gospel at the same time as so many of our fathers have done before us. There's something different about the Christian, and it's a, it's a knowledge of the Savior that passeth all understanding. And that's what we need to get a hold of. And I think there's a very present and truth and a, and a revelation in the Scriptures of how we would do that. We would allow Christ to rebuke us. We would allow the Scriptures to clarify where we went wrong and how we can get it right and reveal Himself unto us, constrain Him to be with us just a little bit longer, and once he's revealed himself, go tell it to others. It's another one of those cyclical things whereby Christ, again, rebukes you, straightens you out. You invite him to do it some more. And then you take what you learn and give it to others. And that is the rejoicing Christian life. That is the meditation upon our heart that allows us to live another day. To rejoice in our sufferings. And to look past the present Look past the hardship, look past the carnality, the vanity of this world, and see with eyes opened the real truth, which is spiritual, which is out of this world, which is the world which is to come. Thank you, Father.